tell me like a little bit about like what would be some of your like you can say the most promising biomarkers that you would have looked at and of course the biovariables as well but uh, the most promising biomarkers that um, uh, maybe even both bleeding edge and cutting edge and uh, something that uh, you would want to watch uh, closely so i think i think we actually have one of i think right now um especially on the cutting edge you know there's a lot of you know the, the more cutting edge wearables are already getting a lot of good data so we already have now you know, nocturnal heart rate. Well, we don't have core temperature. I think that's going to be one of the next big things that somebody is going to try to get onto some of like the wrist worn wearables. Some of the big brands, you know, are trying to figure out how to get better temperature readings. Because even if you look at right now, you know, so the big players, the, the, the whoops, the auras, they do start to give temperature, but they only give you like off of your baseline, but they don't even, they, they say you're down 0.3% of baseline, but they don't even tell you what your baseline is. Right, so like, right. that's not very effective, right? Like that's, that's not re- So I think we need to do better in temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think now, and, but we already have, you know, resting heart rate, SPO2, respiration rate, HRV, of course, um, you know, I've done a yeah. lot of talks on HRV. So the heart rate variability, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a measure of your autonomic nervous system, the relationship with sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, a very important metric to measure. Number of different ways to do it. Some people do it first thing in the morning. Some wearables do it throughout the entire night. Some take a reading just from a certain point, you know, or in your sleep cycle, and then they report your HRV metrics. And then, of course, continuous glucose monitoring is completely changing the nutrition game. But here's the thing. We now need to aggregate all of that information. So I want to know how does this food affect not only my CGM, but my HRV and my nocturnal heart rate, right? So how do we aggregate all of that together? So now that I know that like, oh, I mean, the ultimate bio wearable master device would be something so effective in real time that if you ate a food, your HRV would drop just enough that you would your wearable would say, hey, your body's in, having an inflammatory reaction to that food, which is an astounding idea, but it's possible in the, sometime in the future, probably not too distant future. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely the, the dream that we are chasing as well, uh, with the platform and uh, not to talk uh, too much about it, but I think the power of correlation is actually quite real. and. Um, a metric like glucose, which is unidimensional, just becomes so much more powerful when combined with your activity information, your sleep cycle mm-hmm. information. And today, a lot of guesswork is actually on some of these factors. Like, for example, if my glucose baseline is off, it could be an inflammatory response. It could be a response because I'm uh, consuming uh, like foods with different glycemic index, or it could be because of uh, my sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how do I know that? How do I know which one actually uh happen which can happen more frequently right and and how do they how do they relate to each other like you said how does that that glycemic response in that moment relate to your sleep that night because you know what do you how does it all sort of tie together that's i think yeah. the next phase that we're looking at of aggregating the data so sorry sorry to interrupt please go keep go ahead like as you said earlier there is this subject even though this is way more objective than uh, just observation but this is still a lot of objective data that that if your glucose spikes are closer to uh, when you sleep, your your REM gets disrupted. And when your REM gets mm-hmm. disrupted, you basically have poor recovery leading to poorer glucose response the next day. And it's sort of like in a micro incremental way, it becomes like a downward spiral. Right. And if you didn't, and if you're not getting good enough sleep, you tend to make poor decisions. So you're going to go for that, you know, you're going to go for that unhealthy lunch because you didn't sleep well and then that unhealthy lunch is going to make you more tired and have more of a glucose response on your body then you're going to get more fatigue the next day you're going to make even worse decisions and then you have the spiral of behavior that leads to chronic disease and that's why we have an epidemic of chronic disease because it's all an infinite loop that ties to itself so so we gather the data so right now the biowearables are throwing out a ton of data nobody knows what to do with it Let's be honest. Yeah. Nobody knows what to do with the data. It's just a ton of data. People are sitting there looking at their app on their phone saying, I have no, this is cool, but I don't know what to do. Right. So I think the next phase is we still can't change behavior off of data alone. So we now need to take that data. We need to aggregate it, which is what I think is the next phase. We aggregate the data. So now we can start to create inferences. Like you said, right. 
your glucose spikes, you had 10 glucose spikes this day, your sleep was horrible. The next day you're going to feel like crap, right? Okay. We're going to advise, we're going to prove to you now, here's why that happened. And then we have to have a behavioral modification program that says, here's how you're going to improve it. And that's like going to be further down the road. But once we aggregate the data, then we have to figure out how it's going to change human behavior, you know, and hopefully we can figure it out sooner rather than later, right? Because yeah, almost 90% yeah. of Americans are metabolically inflexible. You know, the statistic everyone throws around is from a, a University of Chapel Hill study. It says 88% of Americans are metabolically inflexible. So, uh -oh. you know, that's, if that's the case, then that means literally, you know, no one's healthy, right? Almost no. So it's so chronic disease and metabolic inflexibility is the norm, right? That's the norm, the standard. So to get out of that is going to be a lift. And uh, I personally, that's why I'm involved in biowearables because I believe that once we get to this, right? Like, so we get the data, aggregate the data and start changing behavior, then maybe we can start to turn this um, train around. This is really, really cool. And I think so many gold nuggets there, but most interesting one is, um, and you know, the statement that you made, like sort of like resonates pretty much with what people used to say about a famous computer scientist said this about personal computers in the eighties, that computers throw a bunch of information at people and people are saying, wow, this is so cool, but we don't know what to do with this, except when you're a computer scientist or a mathematician. Mm -hmm. So do people really need computers, personal computers that do? Not everybody is flying an aircraft or uh, doing complex calculations, right? But now, of course, computers have become ubiquitous. Like they're obviously they are available across our handheld size phones or laptops or every machine. Like everything that we use has a computer built in. So I think in the bioavailable space, if 80s were like, you can say 40 years back and generally it gets faster to scale and create a new category. Right. So if we are in the 80s of bioavailables, uh, maybe it will take 10 years before everybody has a bioavailable on and everybody understands via the interface that we create that this is what they need to do right now to improve the health. I, I love that analogy and that comparison. I think that's that's great. And I, I, I agree with you. It does happen faster and I hope it happens faster because like I said, the uh, the, the conditions of our society require it to do so.